So um, I, got, I was sitting here listening to the music and, and just looking around. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. And I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, I really envy you all because you get to sit there. <laughs> you just get to experience it for whatever it's worth or not worth. And I got to stand here and do something. You know, and, um, and as much as I try to remember that that's a gift, sometimes I think to myself, Can't I just want to, one of y'all come up here, I just want to do that, I'm going to sit down there. And, and then I realize that's not, that's not what I can do. And so my thought is, how do I get to that place where I'm here doing what I'm doing and still experiencing it as gift? I think that's the challenge. That's a challenge, I think, for, for, for ministers and speakers anyway, Right? Um, and, and in the midst of our work, in fact, for whatever work we're doing, I guess maybe am I having a battery issue here that is kind of dropping in and out? No, maybe a signal thing. Um, but but the, the, the sense in which what we are doing is still gift, even though we're doing it um, for the company, for others. You know, um, it's a challenge. I, I have this um, thing I read by this poet, uh, David uh, Riddle, who said that when he was a kid, his mother used to love to take him out into the world, you know, just out into nature, and he spent lots of time out. Maybe that's why he became sort of a teacher, is that he had this experience of, of, of nature, of the giftedness of life. And so as a little boy once, when he was out looking at things in the yard, his mom had come out and said, it's been about an hour or so out there, and he said, David, you need to come on in. And he looked up in all seriousness, he said, and he looked and said, I can't. I haven't paid attention to every single blade of grass. That's kind of what I want to experience right now. I want to experience this moment, what I'm sharing with you, as this amazing opportunity of wonder. And yet I'm preoccupied with this sense that I got to do something, that I got to give you something, that you're going to be expecting something. And it's a challenge, I think, because I think that's what it means to be salt of the earth, is that getting past self-consciousness. And that's the challenge for all of us, I think, getting past self-consciousness and toward a place of consciousness, higher consciousness, God consciousness, that self-reflective awareness that says, this blade of grass, I haven't talked to it yet. You know, this moment right here where I am, I haven't said thanks for this right now. I think that's what it means, at least in one thought, in one aspect, what it means to be salt of the earth. I don't know if you read the blog. I often don't know who reads the blogs or not. So I, I hope I'm not repeating myself too much, but I did hear this story, and I thought it was apropos for the context. Um, woman moved to A young woman moved to an apartment in New York and told her, and one of her friends um, emailed her and said, I'm, I'm coming over. I want to see the place. And so, so her friend gave her instructions and said, sure, it's not too hard to find, you know. And said, what you, what you need to do is you need to take the, the train, the T, and you need to go to the Y station. And then when you get off the train, you know, the train doors will open. When you get off the train, you'll make your way to the left. It's about two blocks till you get to our complex. And she gave the number 481 on the street. And then she said, so you get to the complex, and you'll notice there's a, a big buzzer of, uh, on, the, on the door. She said, well, now with your right elbow, you push that buzzer, and the door will open. You'll have to push your way through as you back into the hallway. And then when you get to the elevator, she said, you'll see the various uh, numbers of all the apartments there. And you have to actually push the buzzer on the apartment number so that I can push the buzzer to release the elevator for you. So with your left elbow, if you'll reach up there and push the number 21, 421, I'm on the fourth floor, and that will open up the elevator for you. Then come on in to the elevator, she said. And then when you get to the fourth floor and the door is open, take a right, go down the hall. Now with your right elbow, knock on the door and, and I'll be waiting for you, and I'll have some coffee. And the, and the friend interrupted and said, what, what do you mean? What, what's all the elbow stuff? What are you talking about? And the girl said, what, you're coming empty-handed? <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the first service. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> it's a joke. I don't like to tell them too often. But you know, it actually sort of made sense to me. 
Because as I think about what Jesus was saying, when I think about this text, you know, we often debate in the, sc- the scholars debate about, well, what was the actual um, uh, historical sayings of Jesus? What weren't the historical sayings? What sayings were sort of rooted in the communities in which those Gospels arose? And they were written 30 to 60 years. The Gospel of John written almost 100 years or so after, after Jesus. So, so there's this debate about these things. But this is one of those sayings that finds its way in all of the Gospels. At the very least, if it were part of the worship communities, it was a part of their ritual to say this thing. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And, and it follows right after in Matthew. It follows right after the Beatitudes, which is particularly kind of profound in the context of what the Beatitudes were all about. So there's this saying, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. And, and the first thought I want you to go away I want you to think about, before, as you leave here, is this idea that we don't come into our moments empty-handed. We never come into our encounters, our moments, even now, empty-handed. We're always carrying something. And I think this particular passage is telling us one of two things. I'm not real sure, honestly. It could be saying one of two things. It could be saying the mandate that we're being, we're being commanded, mandated, commissioned, go into the world to be salt to the earth, to be light. That's how I always heard it, honestly. That's how I always heard it as a seminarian. That's how I always used to preach it, you know. Go into the world, be light of the world. Go into the world, be salt of the world, salt of the earth. And I'm thinking different now. And I hope you don't mind that that's okay to do. That's okay to think differently. It's okay to change your mind after a while. I'm now wondering if it's not an affirmation. If it's not the community saying, we're salt of the earth. We're light of the world. Think about that as opposed to telling you you need to go be, but instead reminding you, did you know you are? But have you forgotten Have we forgotten that? I think we do. I think we do forget it because I think we suffer from something that that basically, you know, last week I talked about the sign we wear, right? Love me. I think we we, we suffer from this challenge of self-consciousness versus consciousness. This challenge of of trying to see that we have a bigger place, a bigger connection with the world. Our essence is like salt. So you think about salt, salt's important, right? It's, it's the number one trace element. It's the mo- most prominent trace element in all the cells of our body more than any other element. It's, we're, we're part made of salt. It's uh, the essence of our origins. You go back to the beginning of evolution and coming out of the ocean, the, the salty ocean. We're part of that reality. It's part of our substance in terms of what we need to survive. It's part of, our, in, the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament times, it's part of the very nature of life. Salt was a preservative. Salt was the way that you kept things fresh that you could eat. Salt was, it was essential in all. It was even traded as, as money. It was a, used as coinage. Salt was significant. For Jesus to say, you're the salt of the earth, was to say something pretty important. Nowadays, it's about 3% of what we, you know, flavoring what we eat is about 3% the use of salt. The rest of it's split between chemical testing and, um, and uh, road covering, <laughs> you know, for ice and such. But for actual eating, it's a very small percentage. And yet still it reminds us it is something at the core of who we are. So for the first thing I want you to think of is we're never ever re-entering our moments empty-handed. Speaking, we're always carrying something but the challenge i think is for us to be thinking in terms of are we carrying something self-consciously or are we carrying consciously and that's a challenge i think because if it's who we are our core how do we get there when we're so preoccupied with everything else we want to be i'll say that again if salt if our essence is of this of God, of the star, of all of life, of the very creator of life, if that's of our essence, then, yeah, you're noticing it, right? Yeah. (laughs) 
So then, how is it Thank you. How is it then that we get to that place where we actually can acknowledge our essence because we're so caught up in self-consciousness? Now, by that, I, I want you to understand what I'm talking about. I'm not necessarily saying that you're self-conscious and like you feel bad about yourself. That's one form of self-consciousness. That's one form of narcissism. But sometimes we're also overly um, proud of ourselves. Sometimes we're pretty caught up in how impressive we are. Self-consciousness can be such a destructive force on all sides. When I was in social work at UT, our, one of our professors uh, spent a class dealing with this, and it was one of the most awkward experiences that I'd ever done. And I'm going to invite you to do this later when you get home. Okay? It's a, it's a really mystical experience. You can do it in your bathroom, and you can <laughs> do it in front of, um, in front of a mirror. Um, <laughs> And, and what, she, what she had us do, I don't know if you've ever done this, what she had us do was she said, go home, stand in front of the mirror. She said, bathroom's kind of a nice place. You need to go somewhere where you can be private and won't be interrupted. And I want you to stare in the mirror. You ever done this? Yeah? Stare in the mirror until you get past what you see. Until you get past what you think you wished you saw. Until you get past what you think you ought to see. Until you get past all of the self-conscious things that you hear. Just keep staring. And then keep staring past that. And at some point, she said, you're going to feel yourself let go. Like for just a moment, you got lost. Like you don't know who's in the mirror. And then you'll catch yourself. But if you're being present to it, she said, you might do what I did the first time that happened. And I giggled. It took me by such surprise, she said, that I just kind of laughed. And then it was back. There it was, the wrinkles, the eyes, the balding. You know, she said, there it was, all that different stuff that I keep worrying about. It's an amazing experience to be able to stand in front of the mirror and disappear for a moment. Something about being salt of the earth, I think, is this idea of disappearing. My wife, Linda, was telling me, she said the other day, she said, you know salt is, you know, you like salt. And I said, well, I like a lot of salt on my food. She says, I know, because you're trying to taste the salt, but now you're not tasting the food. Right? Whenever you get something cooked, you go, needs more salt. You put the salt on it, what do you taste? The salt. She said, if it's really cooked well, and then she smiles like I do, <laughs> you mix the salt in beforehand, just enough that you don't notice it's there. But without it, it wouldn't taste near the same. Being salt in the world has something to do with making a difference in the world and being invisible, which is a real challenge in our culture, right? I mean, we live in an entrepreneurial reality now. Everything's about the name you make. Everything's about the brand you establish. And it's so important that we can be identified for who and what we are so that people are clear about that. This whole idea of being so unselfconscious that we kind of disappear essentially becoming nobody doesn't sound very appealing but at the very core of all of this branding and at the very core of all of this self-consciousness is again we're back to that sign again if you get right down to the heart of it I just want someone to love me just want to be loved just want to feel like I'm part of things just want to belong I remember at this workshop I was at in New Mexico, one of our writers there thought she was one of the most interesting people. And, and uh, she had a couple of college age daughters and, and such. And, and, I and I remember how she was a writer and she'd written a couple of, of books and was a blogger, had a blog online. And her essay, because we were critiquing each other's essays for the whole week, her essay was all about ever since she was a child, she'd wanted to be different. She'd wanted to be distinctive. 
And this whole essay sort of spelled this whole thing out, how she'd kind of gone through one path after another, and she's asking God, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? So for a while, I'm doing this thing, and, and she's making a difference here, and she's engaged here, but she then leaves after a few years and says, but what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And then she moves on to the next thing, and she's written a couple of books, and then, but what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And I didn't have the guts to say, you're doing it. But she couldn't see it. And it's so hard to get to that place to become invisible to ourselves that we, that we can claim that essence of who we really are. So there's a couple of ways we can do it, and that's what I want to suggest to you before we get out of here today, is just a couple of ideas that I think might help. And I suggest you do the mirror thing. I think it's fun. I think it's different. It's always challenging. It's goofy. It's weird, and I'm okay with that too. But I think it surprises if you can commit to it. What a surprise. What a gift to be able to look in the mirror unselfconsciously, you know? Here's the other thing, another point then. Last week, several of us went and saw this movie, some of the improv group. We're going to start improv up again on September the 11th. We're going to do it all over, have a new group, and some of the repeats will come back. I hope you can join us. It'll be for seven Sundays. But um, a bunch of us went to see this movie, Don't Think Twice. Anybody seen the movie? I know some of the improv group did, but it was over at the... Uh, um, uh, uh, Modern Art Museum. It's in, it's in Dallas at the Angelica. I encourage you to go see it. I won't give away too much. But it's, a f it's an interesting movie. Mike Birbiglia, uh, Keegan-Michael Key. Um, there's, uh, there's a bunch of actors and comedians who are part of this. And basically the premise is there is this com there's this um, improv group called The Commune. And they're performing every weekend, kind of like our four-day weekend here in Fort Worth. And they've got the great crowds that are showing up, and they're doing wonderful stuff, and everybody's having a great time. There's five of them, I think, and so they all work together. You know, the concept of improv is this idea that you make one another look good. It's a team kind of effort. Well, on this one particular uh, performance night, they got word from the agent that the theater was going to shut down in, a, in about a month. But they also got word that the Weekend Live, that's basically their version of Saturday Night Live, the Weekend Live production folks are in the audience. And as soon as they say it, Mark, Mike Birbiglia's character looks over at the Michael Keegan, uh, Keegan Michael Key character, and he says to him, he says, don't showboat. <laughs> and the Michael Keegan, uh, Keegan-Michael Key character says, you know, why would I do that? I'm not going to do anything like that. And they said, don't showboat. And he said, no, of course not. Of course, they get out there. The, the routine goes a little bit flat. Suddenly, Michael, uh, Ke I keep saying his name wrong, but Keegan-Michael Key jumps out into the middle of the, of the stage and starts doing his routine, kind of a ticket taker kind of routine from the um, late 19th century. And it's real hamish, and it's lots of fun and silly. And the audience is eating it up. And meanwhile, you look back at the other actors kind of force a smile on the side because they realize what's just happened. A perfect example of self-consciousness. And suddenly he steals the show and everybody applauds and they finish up the show by the end and, and that's when things begin to fall apart. The rest of the show struggles with this issue. Showboating is that kind of struggle we have with who we're called to be in the world. It's that sense of desperation. The ideal of improv is that it's all about the group. It's all about everybody. You make each other look good. But what an ideal. Is it possible to keep that up? Is it possible to live by that ideal in a world like we have, where some of us don't want to outshine the others because maybe our career depends upon it, or maybe our self-esteem depends upon it? Is it really simply uh, too idealistic to assume we could be in a world where we're trying to make others look good, where we're being salt in the world and being invisible. I'd like to say that it's quite possible. I'd like to say that that's what the kingdom of God is all about, but I also realize that it's very challenging. You know, you know my son, my son was one of these guys who got my younger son, Matt, and he's not here, I can talk about him, and he's one of those guys that always got the jokes wrong when they were kids. 
I don't know if your kids did this when, and they were fun to listen to because it's like you don't even get the joke, but it was fun to see how they mix it up. So he, he would come in with the jokes like the one about, uh, he'd say, did, we were telling jokes off the side, and we said, he heard us, the three-legged dog walks into a bar and says, I've come for the man that shot my paw. <laughs> Three-legged dog. <laughs> and then we'd hear Matthew telling it to his friend Paul the next day. He said, I, I, a dog, three-legged dog walks into a bar and says, I've come for the man who shot my dad. And then they all start laughing hysterically. You know, he's always getting them wrong like that, just making them up and then laughing at themselves, you know, unselfconsciously, just having this fun. And then one day he says one of those things that, like, my son, other sons, when they'd say things, we would, like, write them down because we thought, oh, we're in the presence of the divine, you know, the holy. And so he, he tells a knock-knock joke. You can try this with me. Ready? Knock-knock. Exactly. Who's there? Exactly. He had no idea what he was saying. We wrote it down. Decided that was our mantra. The challenge, I think, for Christians, as hard as it is, if you're, for people of faith, for people who are trying, to, I think, to really be unselfconscious, to connect to that higher consciousness, sort of above where all the chatter is, where all the self-consciousness is in the world that's happening, all the branding that's happening, all the Facebook kinds of things that are happening, the world being inundated with this ideal and that ideal. To get above it somehow means to be invisible, to be salt, and yet unselfconscious, and it's a challenge. <coughs> it's hard to get there, I think. Lily Tomlin says in one of her one women shows the search for signs of intelligent life in the universe, she says, all my life I've always wanted to be somebody, but I see now I should have been more specific. <laughs> it is so awkward to be here. Maybe it's awkward to be there. Maybe it's awkward when we stand up and we do some circle dances. Maybe it's hard to sit back when, when you're at your workplace and realize that all that sort of it's me, me, me kind of stuff, it's hard to see in the mirror past all of that. But I think that's what it means to be salt in the world, to be invisible. This other thing I want to suggest to you as we wrap up, and it's this crazy idea that I want to suggest get through all my notes here, is this, is this, it's sort of what, 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 before me, Charles used to say this phrase, yeah, you guys can come on up, um, and we've continued to say this phrase in here, we speak about the kingdom of God, but we really talk about the kingdom of God, you know, last week, how do we see that sign on one another, we're wearing the sign, love me, everybody's got the sign, love me, you know, we're also wearing the sign that says, I feel a little awkward, I feel a little self-conscious. Everybody's wearing that sign. Some mask the sign a whole lot better. Some go out of their way in the, wrong dire in the opposite direction of narcissism to completely prove that sign isn't there. And yet at the bottom, at the core of everything, we're all salt of the earth. We're all part and parcel of creation. It's what we share. How do we live that out ideally? There's a scene at the very beginning of the movie that just, it, it continues to move me. And, I, you know, there were several people that saw it, I think, would say that there were tears to the eyes came a couple of times in this movie, not surprisingly, because it's comedy. But right before they all go on stage, they do the little sort of, whatever you say, they all riff off of it. It's like whatever you offer, all of life is an offering, and they just riff off of it. They riff off of it, you know. But right before they go onto the stage then, they sort of circle in and then they start running around to each other, patting each other on the back. Just patting, just crossing over, patting, making sure they've touched everybody on the back and they keep saying, I've got your back, I've got your back, I've got your back, I've got your back. And they just, they keep that up as they're moving out into life. And I think that's what the kingdom of God is. That's what it means, I think, to be salt of the earth. I've got your back. Amen.